This broadcast of The Third Sector is being made possible through the support of Wayne Bank and Trust Company and the stations of Brewer Broadcasting. Welcome to the Third Sector. My name's Rachel Hughes, and I'm your host today for a nonprofit, a show about nonprofits featuring some of our uh, local agencies. My first guest is Monica Koschlein with the Richmond Symphony Orchestra. Thanks welcome, Monica. Thanks for having me today, Rachel. I appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. I know the folks are going to understand what a symphony orchestra mm -hmm. is. Um, so let's start with some history. When was the orchestra started, mm -hmm. and how long has, has it been in existence? Well, the symphony orchestra began, had its roots in 1956, um, under the direction of Manfred Bloom, who combined a local community orchestra, the Civic Orchestra, with um, Earlham College's orchestra uh, to form the Richmond Symphony Orchestra. So we will celebrate 60 years this year, which we're very excited about. That's amazing. It is. And it seems like every season gets better. It does. and I. Um, not being, only being with the symphony for three years, I rely a lot on people to tell me how things have changed through the years, which they love to share. Um, I think one thing that has uh, really uh, had a strong impact on the symphony is that there's very, been very little change in leadership in the conductor's role. Um, in fact, in the 60 years, um, there have only been three conductors on stage for the Richmond Symphony. That's pretty amazing. It is. and. Um, we're not only celebrating the 60th season this year, we're also celebrating our conductor, Guy Victor Bordeaux's 20th season on stage. That's great. Mm -hmm. it, I think it really is important for nonprofits to have that continuity. It is. And, um, you know, we've, I've watched organizations through the years, um, and when there's turnover in key roles, um, sometimes that can be really healthy for a nonprofit, but it can also help it. It can really hurt it, and it can cause hiccups and, um, and, and cause people to wonder what the real mission of an organization is. So um, it's important, I think, for um, nonprofits to, to call strong leaders that have intention of staying with an organization for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I know your season is, is kicking off very soon. Tell us of what the 60th year is going to look like. Well, when I spoke to Conductor Bordeaux almost a year ago, it was in September, October, we were um, having dinner after a rehearsal. I asked him, I said, what, what do you look for in the anniversary season? Do you want to call back um, uh, a, a very memorable um, guest artist? Do you want to play your favorite piece that you, that you loved performing, some impactful moments, call back some um, previous young artist winners? And he very emphatically said, no, I don't look back. I only look forward. And what I'd really like for in the anniversary season is to celebrate what the possibility of the future might be. So he worked really hard, and I um, spent a lot of time with him as he was preparing the repertoire, um, along with the Artistic Advisory Committee. They worked very hard, um, probably twice as hard as they typically work, and they were able to put together um, a wide selection of pieces. So we will be performing pieces from the 17th century um, um, to as recently as 2013. Um, and so each concert, he worked really hard to add um, some contemporary music, some music that's been recently, um, what, I, what I would say the last hundred years was composed. Um, and that's why um, it just fell in line that we named the season The Best Is Yet To Come. I'm always fascinated with the events that you have <laughs> to, to celebrate your seasons <laughs> and um, uh, to also raise money uh, for <laughs> the symphony. It isn't cheap to do this type of thing, I know. Yeah. Um, uh, tell us something uh, some of, about some of your signature events. And it's more than just a party. It is. Um, the symphony's been really successful lately uh, in its fundraising efforts with the signature event. Um, it, uh, it's been around for 35 years, um, and mostly under the leadership of uh, Ginger Gray and friends. Um, although it has changed through the years. Um, at one time, the symphony um, 
began, uh, started the Festival of Trees, which was an idea that Gene Rush from S The Secret Ingredient had and brought to Richmond. Um, and the Festival of Trees ran its course and um, um, the symphony then began the Legends concerts. And so um, in about six years, the symphony had um, seven um, brilliant musicians on stage. Uh, the symphony performed with Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles and the Beach Boys, um, Winona Judd and others. And um, those were very expensive to put on and they were very high risk. Um, some of which yield, uh, yielded quite a bit of money and some which lost some money. And so it became important for the symphony to be able to have an event that was safe, um, that had low cost with um, the potential for high impact. Um, but most recently, um, I feel as if we've been on a roll. So we, um, in 2014, we were able to celebrate the Boogie Woogie Ball. Um, we chose the airport hangar. Um, and had a salute to World War II veterans and had probably 40 World War II veterans in attendance. And it was a very memorable evening. It was also a very cold evening without <laughs> heat in the facility. But we managed Best laid to survive. Plans, right, Monica? <laughs> it's hard to complain um, about, about the temperature of a building when you have veterans sitting beside you that served in, um, in, in a war. Um, uh, but we, we, we did a fabulous event and, and I, was, I was certain with the mood for the evening that we, we couldn't top it. And I, I said that to Ginger Gray and she said, we don't ever try to top. We always try to just make another moment for people. So we moved from the 40s uh, this last spring into the 50s. Um, we had an event, Shake, Rattle and Roll. Um, we brought um, an Elvis impersonator from Las Vegas who performs with the Million Dollar Quartet and Justin Shandor was quite fabulous, performed with the symphony and uh, it was a very successful event. And this year as we look forward to the spring, we'll be moving into the 60s. We have hired a, a Beatles tribute band that will perform with the symphony and um, we're moving right along. Why are these events so important to the symphony? Well. I, Obviously, the, the most Im important aspect is the financial aspect. Um, we rely on the signature event in order to balance our budget. Um, and the, the signature event is truly charged with not only um, netting a certain amount, but also making up any difference, since it's held at the end of our season, making up any difference, any red that we have in the budget. Um, fortunately, um, with the leadership of that com committee, um, we've been able to um, actually finish in the black and carry some money over. So it's been very successful, it allows us to put some money towards the future. I, the other major component, though, that I think sometimes people miss when they're having fundraisers is that you want to really generate momentum for an organization and you want the organization to appear to be fun. And sometimes when people think of symphony and symphony orchestra and classical music, they think, I can't appreciate that and I can't participate in that and I don't have enough background knowledge to enjoy that. Um, so having an event that really speaks to a different group of people that wouldn't typically be our season ticket holders is really important because we want to have a wide reach and we want to show people that the symphony can really be fun. Um, so we create, we try to create memories, we try to create opportunities for people to have, recall their youth or um, celebrate even my, my daughter came and she knew nothing about Elvis <laughs> before we began <laughs> and knew everything about Elvis after the event was over. So. So it's really fun with a purpose. It's fun with a purpose, yeah. yes. I know that uh, you have some other events that mm -hmm. folks might not know about. And, um, and speaking of your learning events mm -hmm. uh, and opportunities for school children, mm -hmm. share with us a little bit about those. Sure. So the mission of the symphony is really twofold. Um, and I try, to, I try to really state that because I think a lot of people think that we're, we perform symphonic music of the highest caliber. And we, and we do that, and we do that really well. But another component is for us to really provide educational opportunities, and that's educational opportunities for all ages. So we have um, three children's concerts every year, um, a third grade, a fifth grade, and a seventh grade that we'll have here in, in September and October in the fall. Um, those events will reach about 3,600, 3,500 children. 
um, and it's really important to us to raise the sponsorships needed so that schools don't incur any of the costs and neither do families. So no child is turned away because of a financial barrier. So we uh, provide those concerts for free. Um, we have two youth competitions, one for intermediate and high school students and one for high school and college age students. So we're really trying to run that spectrum. Um, fortunately, we have a very generous sponsor in the community um, that allows all children to come to our concerts for free, which is really important. We've uh, seen an increase in families in our audiences and children. We've also created a Kids of Note Club, um, which is um, usually held in the lobby and an opportunity for a child to pick up um, some activity sheets that they can take care that they can take into the into the um, hall. Uh, it might be a scavenger hunt. It might be um, information about a composer for the evening. Just something that's really geared towards kids to make that those opportunities accessible to them. So for folks that think the symphony is just about <laughs> providing these mm -hmm. beautiful concerts, there's so much more to it. There's so much more, and our <laughs> lobbies have become <laughs> so busy. Um, in fact, we have people arriving an hour and a half before our concert sometimes. Oh my goodness. Which is unbelievable and very exciting. Gives us an opportunity to really network and get to know our audience. Um, an hour before our concerts, we have a pre-concert conversation. Um, our conductor and the guest artist and some of our musicians participate in that. They talk about their experiences as musicians as well as the music for the evening. Um, just, uh, there's just so much going on that people want to arrive early and be a part of it. So we've got just two minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I want to touch on how the symphony is funded. We've touched on a few of mm -hmm. those, um, but fill us in a little more on where do you get your funding mm -hmm. and how can folks participate in the symphony? We rely very heavily on sponsorships and um, it's very important to the board that we keep the ticket prices as low as possible. So the ticket prices will help us cover only about a third of the costs of what the concerts actually cost us. And our sponsorships and our contributions and donations make up the rest. Um, we're active, we actively um, write grants. We're always busy with that and just, I don't know, just scrambling, but not scrambling in a negative way. Um, another important part, and I hope I have time to share it, is that it's also really important for the symphony to be seen as a community partner and to support the work of the other nonprofits in this community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you do a good job of that. Well, thank you. Um, I know that you'll have a lot of volunteers mm -hmm. that support the symphony, so let's wrap up with telling folks how can they get information on season tickets or individual tickets and how do they volunteer if they would like to be involved in that way? So the best way to contact us is by phone or email. Um, I have someone in the office from 8 to 4 every day at uh, area code 765 nine six six five one eight one and an email is another way we're very responsive to that at richmondsymphony.org uh, that's our website that's an opportunity to contact us that's an opportunity to find out of our events and upcoming concerts that's great mm -hmm. thank you for being with us today and sharing some of the facets we might not have known about the symphony great. thank you and good luck with your upcoming season thank you <laughs> we'll be right back with more third sector <laughs> Youth as Resources grants are available for up to $500. Applications are accepted for student-led projects that address a critical community need. We accept applications throughout the year, and grant award decisions are made directly following a screening meeting between your student group and our committee. Find out more online at yarwayne.org. Welcome back to The Third Sector. My guest now is Ty Muldoon for Birth to Five. Welcome, Ty. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rachel. Let's talk about Birth to Five. Been around a long time. In fact, mm -hmm. I believe you're celebrating an anniversary this year. 25 years in Wayne County. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. We were just talking with the symphony. They've been around 60 years, so you have a little ways to go, but mm -hmm. 25 years is quite a milestone. Thank you. For those uh, who are watching and really don't understand what Birth to Five is, talk us through that a little bit. I know there are two programs that make up the Birth to Five organization. Mm -hmm. uh, share with us a little about each of those programs. All right. Birth to Five has parents as teachers and the Healthy Families program. 
The Parents as Teachers program offers monthly visits to families all over Wayne County. They also provide book buddies events and play groups. All of their services are free and voluntary to any Wayne County family. Uh, they also provide Happiest Baby on the Block classes for new and expecting mothers to help teach them how to calm their crying infant. The Parents as Teachers program has been around the longest from birth to five and they are the most well-known program that we offer. Within their program, they also support uh, local daycares with their supporting care providers program where they go in and they work with daycare providers on expanding their curriculum or different activities that they can do with children at their site. Our other program is the Healthy Families Program and that is a more intense program. Those services start weekly in homes for families. Those provide support to families all over Wayne County as well. They are also free and voluntary. The program with Healthy Families provides child safety information, different ways to budget, connect families to resources all over Wayne County, and just be another support for the family as they're raising either one or multiple children. So let's start taking those components apart because that's a lot going on for one organization. Let's start with some that may be pretty well known. Tell okay. us what Book Buddies is and why is that important for Birth to Five to conduct those? Okay. Book Buddies events are amazing. They are open to any child in Wayne County. They are generally from about two and a half or three up until kindergarten readiness. Uh, it just kind of depends on where the site is that we're holding the event. They're offered fairly regularly throughout the year and people can go to our website or our Facebook page to learn more about those. But they're around an hour long. They'll have a craft and activity and a book that the children can take home. We've hosted them at the Jazz Stadium where the players actually read to the kids <laughs> on the uh, field and the children loved that. We've hosted them all over Wayne County at different sites. But it's just to encourage literacy because we know children are not reading at the level they need to be by the time they're entering kindergarten, let alone third grade. So it's just another way to encourage parent-child reading in the home and to get a book in some of those children's hands. So in some cases, I would imagine there, there are children whose parents maybe are illiterate, don't know how to read, mm -hmm. or maybe have never seen this behavior modeled. Mm -hmm. So you're actually providing some behavior modification, maybe even to the parent, as well as showing the child why reading is important. Yes, we have had an awesome woman come in and teach us dialogic reading, which is just how to expand on the pictures in the story, to talk about what's happening in the book. So even parents who are illiterate or dyslexic can read to their child. You don't have to read the words to read a book. That's very so, important. Mm -hmm. You also talked about play groups. Yes. Some folks out there may think, why are they getting together to play? Mm -hmm. What's important about that for children? Play groups provide an early chance for socialization. So some children who are especially watched in the home by family members or you know a small site don't get the interaction with other kids. So play groups are open to anyone in Wayne County. Uh, we have newborns all the way up to you know children who are home from pre-K for the day. Uh, it's just a chance for the families to interact with each other as well. You can ask other parents questions. You can ask a parent educator from the Parents as Teachers program specific questions about our programming or what your child may or may not be doing as well. So it's that socialization aspect for our, both parties, you know, the parent and the child, that are so beneficial. So it's, it's almost a stepping stone to pre-K and kindergarten is getting them ready to be around other kids and how to behave and um, just to kind of burn some steam off too. <laughs> <laughs> That's important when they're that mm -hmm. age. Um, is it only open to parents? No, we have other caregivers, aunts, uncles, cousins, um, grandparents. We have several grandparents that bring children that they're watching. Um, it can be any caregiver any caring adult in that child's life. Any caring and, adult. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a neat program. Um, it sounds like that there's a lot of learning through play mm -hmm. with those types of programs. Yes. Uh, very beneficial from the research I've read. Mm -hmm. Tell us now about the other part of Birth to Five, the home visits and the mm -hmm. screenings and okay. some of those programs. So Parents as Teachers, like I said, offers monthly visits to families. They are in the home, so that is a regular worker that is assigned to that family that goes in 
that way that family can build a relationship with their worker. It's somebody that provides developmental screenings to the children, developmental information, different activities that they can do. Um, all of the home visitors in both programs joke that we can make about 62 different games or activities out of a water bottle and some rice. So it's just showing them how to expand beyond just a toy with a child. You know, how can you use everyday interactions with your child to teach them things? Um, both programs do provide child development curriculum, so research-based information that we can get in the family's hands about this is generalized information about what your child should be doing at this age. Um, if the family feels like their child is not doing that, then we provide a referral to First Steps or their family care physician to hopefully get an early intervention going for that family. So this isn't about you going in and telling the parents what they're doing right or wrong. Correct. We are not there to tell somebody how to raise their child or what they're doing right or wrong. It's all about connecting that family to resources and education. Um, they are all very um, family focused, so it's not just we're there to play with your child either. So we hear that a lot. So you're coming to play with our baby. No, we're showing you different ways that you can play with your baby. Um, both really focus on the parent-child bond, so ways to connect to your child on a different level. And again, in some cases, modeling a behavior those parents might not have seen modeled Correct. when they were, were growing mm -hmm. up. Um, I know we have saved Pringle cans and different things, yes. so <laughs> when you, you joke about all the different toys you can mm -hmm. make with a water bottle, um, I think sometimes we forget our children learn through discovery, mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be an iPad or an expensive toy. Right. But how do things fit mm -hmm. together? Yeah. How um, my it, son's favorite toy is measuring cup. <laughs> there you go, um, and I think too that one of the services I've seen that you provide is telling the parents you don't have to have a million dollars worth of toys. Correct. It's okay to help them learn with things that are around the house. Yes. Uh, when, when my kids were growing up, they played with bowls and spoons. Mm -hmm. You know, it was feeling the textures, making the noises, putting things together. Mm -hmm. Yes. You've talked a lot of, about a lot of different programming. Mm -hmm. How do you pay for all of this if there's mm -hmm. no cost to the families that participate? Yes, so one of our programs does get funding from the TANF program, essentially. That's that's the short, short end of it. Um, so that program is mostly funded through federal dollars. Our Parents as Teachers program is funded all by grants or private donations. Um, Parents as Teachers is a national program, but they don't receive national funding. Um, Healthy Families is a Department of Child Services um, child abuse and neglect prevention program. So we do receive funding for that. Um, but we, we just ask. I mean, people really enjoy our programs. They see the benefits to children all across Wayne County. So we have a lot of support from Wayne County families, individuals, past you know members of the program that help keep our funding going. And as well, the Wayne County Foundation, they're one of our biggest supporters and read, um, read community benefit, I almost said, uh, they also provide support to us among others like United Way and local foundations. So I would imagine that you also partner with them on programming and prevent uh, preventative child abuse measures and that type of thing as well as uh, financial support from these organizations. Correct. We've got just a few minutes left. Um, I'd like to touch on uh, how your organization is governed. Who, who runs Birth to Five? I know mm -hmm. that you have a board of directors, but mm -hmm. share with the folks that are listening what a board member would look like for Birth to Five. A board member can be anyone. Um, a past family member of Birth to Five, someone who um, has IT support or just connections to other people to help spread our mission. Um, we don't have a face of birth to five like some organizations do. Um, we know that all of our families are different, so we feel like all of our board members should be different. Um, whether somebody has financial background or social services backgrounds, um, pretty much anyone who understands that our mission is to serve children would be an excellent board member.
So if there are folks out there that really have a passion for helping young children, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like there's a few ways they could volunteer, maybe with the play groups. Correct. Um, if they have experience maybe as a board member. Mm -hmm. uh, if they wanted to reach out to you, how could they get in touch with the organization? They could call our office, 765-966-6080, or visit our website, mybirth25, spelled out, dot org. Um, or they could, you know, email us our information on our Facebook page or our website, um, and then we talk to them further about both of our programs. And the other side of the coin, if there are families out there that are saying, I'd really love to have the services, mm -hmm. is there a wait list right now? Or do you have openings for families? We currently have openings. So they would just call the office and somebody would talk to them about the two programs and which would be a better fit for them. So we do have a screening process to walk them through which of our programs would be the best fit and who their worker might be. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for being with us mm -hmm. today. Thanks. I think we've learned a lot about Birth to Five and mm -hmm. hopefully shared with our audience some information that will be helpful to them and to the organization. Thank you. And thank you for being with us today on The Third Sector.